uh, to have you in the ninth, yeah. ninth uh, lecture of the course. We are almost finishing and we are in the final line. <laughs> Thank you very much and welcome to, uh, to the group again. Thank you. Wow, muchas gracias, Professor Cesar, and thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here, and I am safely back from my trip to Moriflores. It was most beautiful area I have seen in my life, very beautiful, and we had some cooking expertise developed for arepas, <laughs> and then I helped cooking Indian food to the local people. We had some 10, 15 uh, people from Colombia. They learned about how to cook the Indian food. So we made some Indian food for them. It was a good experience. And then I went to the Tunkha. Tunkha. And then the... Ramiriki. Ramiriki. <laughs> <laughs> that was a beautiful place. And it was a great experience to meet so many people. Even though the language was a challenge for me, but then there was no dearth of love. Everybody was very, poquito, very poquito. good. Yeah, poquito, poquito, I spoke. <laughs> so today is my ninth lecture. And uh, today we are going to talk about the new strategies to treat age-related macular degeneration using polymeric biomaterials in ophthalmic drug delivery. So I have been working in that area since almost last 10 years. and have several publications in that area and I'm going to discuss some of the research, actual hands-on research we do in our laboratories in this uh, workshop. So, no, no, no problem. Recording. The recording means, oh, it's okay. Sorry. Yeah. Perfect. So I'm going to talk about Colombia, Ila, Gente, De Aqui, Mi nombre es Yashwan Patak, actualmente estoy en USA. Uh, soy profesor y decano asociado, profesor en associate dean en la Universidad del Sur de Florida, Taneja College of Pharmacy. Estoy en Colombia como becario Fulbright Specialist. Uh, sincere thanks to Universidad Distrital Francisco Jose de Caldas for hosting me as a Fulbright Specialist here in Bogota. My sincere thanks to Rector Dean and other administrative heads supporting my trip here. My sincere thanks to Fulbright Specialist Commission of Colombia for supporting my trip to Bogota, Colombia. And I will fail if I do not mention my sincere gratitude to Professor Cesar Aurelio Herano Peru, being my host and incredible support for making my stay happy here. And we also suffered a little bit both this weekend, but it was okay. <laughs> Special thanks to Reem Abdilohum and Shannon Fleming of World Learning and Sergio Vilamir Sanchez and Sebastian Wali, uh, Vila Mizar and many others from Colombian Fulbright Commission for their kind support. Professors Luis H. Reyes and Juan C. Cruz and Willy Moreno and Luis Fernando Cruz Cuergo. A uh, special thank to Professor Alexis Ortiz from International Office of UDFJDC and Alvaro Vasquez for who encouraged me to apply for this Fulbright Specialist Fellowship for Colombia. Encouragement of all is so supportive and the outcome is I am here. Desde el fondo de mi corazón. Apologies for my Spanish pronunciation. If you understand my Spanish, then you will understand my English. Miss Disculpas for me as panel. So age related, I, uh, there are certain figures I have taken from the different web sources. So kindly use it for your personal use and only for educational purposes. So age related macular degeneration is we have several uh, vessels, blood vessels in our eye. In, in the posterior eye, behind the eye, what we see is the outside is the anterior eye and the posterior eye. This is the this is the anterior eye and this is the posterior eye. <laughs> and you'll find that there are several 
blood vessels here. Now what happens is if the pressure in the posterior eye start growing, then that pressure creates the arteries and vessels to blow off. And when they blow off, these type of small particles are released out of the blood vessels and they accumulate there and they become like black spots. And then over the period of time, this is the portion is called as macula. And this portion allows us to see the central vision. And that's why as these particles or black spot grow here, your vision steadily start seeing. And then what happens is when you see this picture, you will find that you see a white house here. But if you have, if you are suffering from macular degeneration, then you see the central portion black. And then you see the side of side trees, you see everything and the person start asking you, where is the white house? Where is the house? Where is the house? And you say, oh, but it's right there. It's right there. And you say, he said, no, 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 I don't see it. And then you realize that you are suffering from macular degeneration because this is how that oozing out black spots block your vision, central vision. And if suppose your central vision is clear, but your peripheral vision is not clear on this side, then it is called glaucoma. So these are the two things. So leading cause of visual loss in adults over age 50, loss of sharp uh, central vision. This is called central vision. And that is where the people lose their vision and that is called macular degeneration. So the key facts are 253 million people live with this vision impairment. 36 million are blind. 217 million have moderate to severe vision impairment. 80% of the people who are blind have moderate or severe vision impairment are aged 50 years and above. So this macular degeneration mostly happens in chronic, it's a chronic disease. And it happens mostly when you start aging. It's a part of the aging process because the pressure which is built up in the eye, it gradually grows. And that's where, because your controlling system is now in imbalance. And that's where the things start growing. So chronic eye diseases are the main cause of vision loss and uncorrected refractive errors like wearing the glasses is re corrected refractive errors. Uncorrected refractive if you don't wear the glasses then gradually you lose your eyesight. And unoperated cataracts are the top two causes of vision. If you have a cataract and if you don't operate it then the cataract will make you blind for the period of time. And unoperated cataract remains the leading cause of blindness in low and middle income group. And this is now directly related to the economic status of the country. If you are in the low economic status of the country, then automatically you don't have facilities to provide to the people. And that's where people do not go. So cataract is also something like a block. And you start, it is more on the posterior eye side. So cataract posterior eye side gradually covers and it matures. Once it matures, if you don't remove it, then it spreads and then you become blind there. The prevalence of infectious eye diseases such as trachoma and oncocerasis, cirrhosis has reduced significantly over the period of 25 years because we have a good number of antibiotics available for eye treatment and 80% of the vision impairment can be prevented or cured if you look at it and have your uh, eyesight regularly checked. Especially if you have a diabetes, then you should check your eyesight every year or at least every six months so that you will know you are suffering from retinodiabetes, diabetic retinopathy or not. So we have tried this YouTube video, but next time we will do that. So according to the recent estimate, major global cause of moderate to severe vision impairment are uncorrected refractive error 53%. Up, unoperated cataract 25%, age related macular disease 4%, glaucoma 2%, diabetic retinopathy 1% and major causes of blindness are unoperated cataract 35% and uncorrected refractive error is 21% and glaucoma 8%. So these are some of the causes there. So people age 50 and over are suffering from that. So about 65% of the people over, you must have seen that as soon as you become 40 years old, then you start looking at the paper like this. That means you have a refractive problem. But people don't accept it. Like, you know, I have, I work with a lot of women. 
most of our 70% are women. So they will look like this. So I tell them, buy the glasses. You need the reading glasses now. But they said, no, 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 I am beautiful. I don't want to use glasses. Yeah. And that's where this uncorrected refractive measures are problem. Because then they become, they big, get big glasses by the time they reach 60. And this is where, so after 40, it's normal to get a glasses. And you, if you are smart enough to use the glasses, then you will keep your eyesight for a longer time. If you don't use the glasses and you look like this, then there is a problem. <laughs> people do that. A lot of people don't want to wear the glasses. And, correct, yeah. And then a lot of people by your, when you are young, you sit on the table and then you have a light, you study. Once you become 40, 45, you don't sit on the table. You sleep on the bed and start reading. It's a very normal process because it's aging. And when you start reading, sleeping, now the angle of light is different. And as the angle of light is different, then you start having eye problems. Or itching in the eyes, irritation in the eyes, because of the position you read. And then if you like novel, the novels, the text is very small, font size. So obviously you try to enlarge your eyes. And that's where you start having challenges with the age. Another area is 15 and under 15 because those children cannot tell they are suffering from and that's why 12 million children are visually impaired due to refractive errors. If they correct it then they, are, they can use glasses and use it and new uh, technology is creating more problems for them. So this is a simple US statistic we had seen it in another presentation also the UITs, conjunctivitis, age related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, retinal vein occlusion and cytomegalovirus retinitis. These are some of the things. So you have to understand the physiology of the or physiology and anatomy of the eye. So this is your pupil which you see from outside. This is the lens here and this lens allows you to see the stuff. And then this lens is covered with all the nerves and whatever you see, these nerves will send it to the brain and then it will act. And all these things are done through the retinal system and you have your posterior eye which is a macula and this is the retina which is a nerve layer and this is communicating with the brain, optic nerve and that leads to the brain. And here if there is the accumulation of the blood spots or blood clot then you start having challenges with seeing the system. So this is another, you know, this is how the eye looks like, post anterior eye. Iris, pupil, sclera, eyelid, and this is the eyeball. And then just behind this, you when you do the injection, you just lift the eye. And then you put the injection inside. So you will have this cavity here, so you can lift this up, cornea and this eyeball, and then put the injection here, and you can see here. So these are all different parts of the eye, even though it is such a small thing, but it has got several different sections. And all these sections are useful uh, in understanding the macular degeneration. So your topical drug administration is topical for UITs, conjunctivitis, intraocular, you give in injections, like this is topical, you do the drops on the outside eye. Intraocular is you inject it near the retinal nerve and then that is intraocular. Periocular is you put outside the eye and then systemic is you put through the blood vessel. So age-related macular degeneration is normally intraocular. You put the needle inside and then you inject it there. Periocular is adjacent to glaucoma, which is outside because your peripheral vision is controlled here. And cytomegalovirus, you put antibiotic through the systemic system. So this is typical way of doing. And now, uh, as we have mentioned that how this can be a absorption site for the drug, but it is a very little area which is available 24 millimeter by 23 millimeter. So automatically, you if you have nanoparticle, then the absorption will be higher. And that is the advantage of nano drug delivery system there. So some of the routes of administration benefits and challenges of ocular degradation really topical is high patient compliant because you just drop the aisle, eye drop there, self-administrable, you can administer yourself and non-invasive. But challenges is the higher tier dilution and turnover 
red cornea acts as a barrier and efflux pump and absorption is only 5%, less than 5%. So even if you put the eye drops in the eye, 95% is thrown out. So, but it is used for keratitis, uveitis, which is a post anterior eye infection, conjunctivitis, sclerotis, episcleritis and blepharitis. So, these are the diseases which are cured by the antibiotics and you can use from the outside. Then there is the oral and systemic patient compliance because oral is good. A non-invasive route of administration, BAB, BRB, high dosing causes. But again, the absorption is very low in the eye, only 2%. And sclerotis, episcleritis or CMV retinitis, uh, these are some of the diseases which they are using. It. Intravitreal is direct delivery to vitreous and retina and sustained drug delivery and evades blood-brain barrier. And retinal detachment, hemorrhage, cataract, endo, uh, ophthalmitis, patient in compliance and then these are various drugs which are used for um, these diseases there. Then intracameral is a provides higher drug levels in the anterior chamber, eliminates usage, tropical drugs. Now these are tasks and these are like implants in the body outside the eye and they stay there for a longer time and then they can release the drug. So anesthesia, prevention of endo endothalamitis, Anesthesia is like suppose you want to give an injection inside the eye for macular degeneration, then you give an injection as an anesthesia in the posterior, inter, anterior eye and then once that is anesthesi anesthetized, then you lift it and put the injection there. So you normally get two injections, mm -hmm. one is for anterior eye and one is for posterior eye. And then some subconjunctivital is another area delivery to anterior and posterior segment site for depot formulation. So you can have polymers which can remain there either in anterior or posterior eye and they can be injected inside. So they are used for glaucoma, CMV, retinitis, AMDI, age-related macular degeneration and subtenon, another area of high vitreal drug levels and then they are used for different types. So you know there are several ways of injecting the drugs. Retrobulbar is administered high local doses of anesthetics more effective than the peribulbar, minimal influence on IOP and then they are used as anesthesia. And posterior juxtascleral, safe of, for delivery of depot formulation, sustained drug levels up to six months to the macula. So this is another thing where you polymer, you put it inside the posterior eye, it forms a depot. Mm -hmm. And when the depot is formed, then gradually the drug is released for six months. So you don't have to frequent injection. That is another area. Mostly you, it requires surgery and it, uh, Retinoepithelial cells acts as a barrier, so it is a surgery which has to be done there. So we have different types of drug delivery system solution, micro suspensions, ointments, inserts and implants and we talked about that earlier. So now what are the specific challenges of ocular drug delivery? Poor drug viability, because if you put it outside eye only 5% is absorbed. If you put it uh, systemic only 2% reaches the eye, so there is a channel challenge of viability of the drug, instability of dissolved drug. If you put it inside, then this, it is not stable, so it gets degraded very quickly. But there are enzymes. Eyes have their own enzyme system to degrade the material and irritation to the patients. So challenges based on route of administration are topical lacrimation barrier, therapeutic concentration, periocular injection, blood ocular barriers, intravitreal injection, retinal detachment, and cataract formation. These are very common. So you can virtually get a cataract while you are injecting and then cataract builds up in your eye. So if the doctor is not very good, then there is a possibility that you suffer from macular degeneration plus cataract because of the mistake of the doctors. Uh, so you have uh, nanobiomaterials which are used to enhance corneal penetration, prolong contact time with ocular tissues, reduce irritation of patients, solve solubility issues, poor, poor bioavailability and decreased dosing, diminished toxicity, resistance to clearance and degradation. Now we have seen some of these things in a previous talk about SIRNA delivery. So SIRNA is another advanced technique now people are using but there is no a um, lot of experience have to be done, there is no product available for that. So nanobiomaterials used for drug delivery systems is nano suspension, polymeric gels, ocular inserts and ocular implants are there. So what we are doing is we are using the polymers to build up the polymeric drug delivery system so that we can reduce the 
frequency of injection and that's why uh, commonly used by synthetic, uh, synthetic biopolymers are polyethylene glycol, polylactic acid, polylactic co glycolic acid and then create co block polymers of these combinations of that. So if you, uh, you have to understand one thing that if your drug is highly hydrophobic in nature then you may use polycaprolactone and put it there and then combine it with polyethylene glycol so that there will be channels to release the drug. And because polyethylene glycol is hydrophilic in nature, polycaprolactone is a hydrophobic in nature. So combination of hydrophilic, hydrophobic polymer will give you release of the drug. Mm -hmm. If you exclusively use polycaprolactone, then the depot will sit in your eye but does not release anything because there are no channels created. But if you use poly ethylene uh, glycol peg, then the peg is hydrophilic. So gradually the peg will dissolve and create channels. They are macro channels and the drug will start coming out of polycaprolactone. And as the concentration gradient is created, so always the drug will travel from high concentration to low concentration. So your depot will have high concentration, it will go to low concentration. So it will be released out. And that is how your combination of polymers are utilized for that. So you use different types of polymers, liposomes are there and then nanoparticles are there. You have many different types of dendrimers are there. So use different types of polymers which can be 6 hours and if your particle size is less than 200 nanometers, they can be localized in retinal pigment epithelial cells and that becomes very useful. So we have in situ polymer gels. They are at normal temperature, they are solution. And as soon as they come to body temperature, they become gel and then they be solidify. And that is called in situ polymer gel. So in situ is you, when you inject in the eye, it is a solution. So it is easy to inject the solution. As soon as it comes into the eye, then it becomes gel because of the polymer structure. And that's how you get this. So these are physiological stimuli. You can use physical changes in biomaterial solvent exchange chemical reactions or photo irradiated polymerization. These are some of the techniques you can adopt with this polymer to create the gel out of that. So it is easy to administer because it is liquid. It's a clear liquid in the while injecting and improved bioavailability, reduced dose concentration, reduced dosing frequency, gelation property, prevent circulation and slow down clearance and improved patient compliance because you are reducing, reducing the frequency of the disease uh, injection. So polymer gels are normally, this is like a PLGA 50-50. So you put PLGA nanoparticles, this you incorporate your drug inside, encapsulated green particles are the drug. And then they look like this under scanning electron microscope. So these are PLGA nanoparticles. Now what you do is you create a PLGA nanoparticle and then incorporate those nanoparticles in another polymer, which is hydrophobic, so that it remains in the eye as a depot for a longer time. That's what we try to do it. So biodegradable hydrophilic co block copolymers are biocompatible are PEG, PLGA, PCL, PLA, ideal for poorly soluble drug, prevent recirculation back into anterior segment and slowing down clearance. So that is the advantage of that. So this is the typical trimicinolone acetonide nanoparticle. Trimicinolone is used for treating macular degeneration. It reduces the macular degeneration. And this is how the sustained release is obtained. You can use different types of polymers and you will get, this is the typical, uh, you know, if you inject it directly the drug and then if you inject in polymer, you can see that the sustained release is much at many days, you know, hours, 70 hours it can retain there. So this is a scanning electron microscope image of the PLGA TA triamicinolone acetonide nanoparticle. This is how they look like in vitro release is there. So then there is a, if you use PLGA, PEG, PLGA gel, like you are looking at now two polymers there. So you will find that the drug release can continue over the period of almost 35 days. So now it is going one month. Now you have to understand that all these studies are done in 10 ml to 20 ml of dissolution solution. But in the eye, there is never 10 ml solution available. And that's why this can be extrapolated for the eye capacity is only 0.5 ml or maximum 1 ml if you really want to see that. But 1 ml is also very difficult there. So obviously this can be extrapolated to many days. Uh, 
possible. So sustained delivery of ganciclovir from PLGA. Ganciclovir is an antibiotic used for eye treatment, eye infection for cytomegalovirus retinitis. And this is how. So what we have done is our lab ophthalmic drug delivery research is uh, we created PLGA PEG nanoparticles. Drug delivery by age related macular degeneration. So we use corticosteroids which remove the inflammation in the eye. They are all anti-inflammatory drugs. So triaminosinol, uh, sinolone, acetonide, dexamethasone and lotoprenol etabonate. These are the three drugs we tried. These are used for macular degeneration but not as nanoparticles. So we tried to put it into the PLGA, PEG, PLGA, re thermoreversible gel. Thermoreversible gel is it becomes gel if the temperature is up, it becomes solution if the temperature is low. That is called thermoreversible. The gel soul formation is dependent on the temperature. We are there. So what we did was PLGA, PEG, corticosteroid was then triamicinolone acetonide incorporated into a PLGA, PEG polymer. Then it is created a solution and then it forms a gel at certain temperature, 25 degrees, 20, 25 degrees, it is a solution. Once it gets into 37 degrees centigrade, forms a gel and it becomes sticks there and it remains there. So that is the... So we had the characterization of nanoparticles. So we prepared our nanoparticles and then we used... Uh, so our blank nanoparticle size was around 125 nanometers. When we added triamicinolone, it became 208 nanometers. We added lotoprednolol, it became 168 nanometers and um, dexamethasone. So all our particles, nanoparticles were less than 200 and that is the advantage of and then polydispersity index is when your particle size is compact, the polydispersity index is lower. So if it is less than 0.1, then you are very good. So our polydispersity index for the black was 0 0.014, which is very low. And then we had 0 0.005, 0 0.0142, 0 0.035 and this is how our particle size distribution was excellent there. So we did study the particle size distribution uh, curve and this is how we got it into our Wyeth technology dynamic pro plate reader and that was normal distribution less than 1%. We looked at the particles and this was like individual particle we tried to find out and this is how it looks like blank nanoparticles and TA nanoparticles under the scanning electron microscopy with 180 nanometer particle size. So we tried to characterize the Triamicinolone nano acetonide nanoparticles encapsulation efficiency. How much really drug gets into the nanoparticles? So we found that our drug loading can be 11 milligrams, which is 47.5 percent loading. So this will help you to understand how much dose you have to inject. And that drug loading for lotoprednolol it was only 8 milligrams, while dexamethasone was 8 milligrams. So you can see 47 percent, 82 percent, and 30 percent. They based on the dose efficiency was there and then uh, we can we to calculate that percent encapsulation efficiency the actual drug concentration theoretical drug concentration multiplied by 100 and that was our so uh, to understand what is soul gel uh, thermoreversal property so this is your polymer you incorporate into the water or aqueous system and then it is in the solution at one point it is in solution this is body temperature uh, this is the temperature 20 degrees. Now as soon as it goes to 37 degrees, it gets converted into gel. So you have a clear solution you inject inside the eye. When it is incorporated and at the body temperature, it will become milky solution. So you can see only when you inject in the rat eye, it's only one drop. You know, not even one drop. It's a very small dose you need that. So this is how it looks like soul gel formation and it is reversible. Uh, if you bring it back to 20 degrees, it will become solution. So in vitro drug release, we did, now you can understand, this is our drug de delivery system. So we used to use 20 milliliters of the liquid. So you will find that you will never get that. So whatever release profile you are getting will be much more extended. So this was our trimissional release within 48 hours. We saw that. And then this is trimissional nanoparticle formulations were released in 168 hours. So this is how this was sustained release we could see and we used UV spectrospectroscopy to analyze this uh, drug content in the nanoparticle. 
then we try to find out whether our nanoparticles are cytotoxic or not, or whether they kill the cells. Okay, if they are killing the cell, then they are useless. So we studied the major measure the cytotoxicity of trimycin acetonide nanoparticles and nanoparticle gel in human retinal pigment epithelial cell ARP19 they are called. So we had culture of the cells and we incorporated our nanoparticles into the cell to see whether they are killed or not and we found out that uh, all the RP cells were stable and did not interact with it, they did not kill the ARP cell 19, so we are, our formulations were not cytotoxic, they were okay. Then we measured the cytotoxicity increasing concentration of dexamethasone, so we used different types of dexamethasone nanoparticle concentration and we showed that our nanoparticles are not cytotoxic in nature, they do, do not cause the death, in certain cases it does cause death, so we have to understand that very high level like Android micromolar will cause some death there for the cells. Then we measure the cytotoxicity of increasing concentration of lutepredinolol and you will find that here the curves are almost similar, 90%. So there was no, uh, this was much stable and more biocompatible system with lutepredinolol drug delivery system. Then we, you know the, the concentration of Vajayaf is a biomarker in the eye. So you measure the Vajayaf concentration and that Vajayaf is expression is, if there is a higher expression then it is working very well. So measure the Vajayaf secretion after 72 hours of exposure to 10 microliter TA and TA DDS formulation and you will find that the Vajayaf concentration was going down and this is what helps in reducing the macular degeneration that is the, uh, which showed that we, it significantly reduces the Vajayaf concentration in the system. Then we try to study the cellular uptake of our nanoparticle, whether the ARP cells take the nanoparticles or not. So we use coumarin loaded nanoparticles to show that, you know, they were blue in color. And you will see that the nanoparticles were uptaken or taken up by the ARP19 and you can see the existence of coumarin loaded nanoparticles inside the cells. And that, that means it is working systematically in two hours treatment. So then what we did was, we wanted to see the uh, choroidal neovascularization, that is what macular degeneration means, even macular degeneration nothing but the choroidal nanovascularization, the blocking and that is called CNV mouse model. So we had created this mouse model, we have a, this is widely used in many, so what you do is you initially inject inside the eye take polyethylene glycol. When you inject it, it gradually builds up the choroidal nanovascularization which is causing the macular degeneration. So you create macular degeneration in the eye of the rats. And so what you do is in the first week you create CNV induction like this and then you treat first treatment, after two weeks you do the second treatment, then four weeks third treatment and then you take out the eye, take out the choroidal neovascularization and me measure the size of it. And then also use to find out what is the Vajayaf expression. So you mix the tissues with solvents and then find out the Vajayaf expression, how much it is. So that is called, uh, this is how the experimental process was. So we started initially, so you will find that this is the eye of a rat injected, peg 8 was injected in the eye of a rat and then this is how the eye looks like. Uh, we injected the peg, small amount of peg and then this is how CNV induced macula. So after the injection of peg inside the eye, you start getting the CNV, choroidal neovascularization, that is called macular degeneration. And if you don't do it, now this is normal. So you won't see that type of accumulation of the blood vessels. And now you can take this out, this portion which is formed, take it out by operation of this. So collected choroid and collected choroid are two different things in this right eye. It's a very serious, very interesting thing. So if you see it with the, uh, under the, microscope, you can see the formation of that choroidal new. So these are the spots which show the formation of choroidal new vascularization induced in injuries. So CNV leaky blood vessels are here, they form the and 
one with non perfusion doesn't have that so now you have control there is no cnv induced this is the cnv induced and you can see control average and then cnv high concentration of cnv the comparison between the area of retinal choroidal blood vessels in the control eye with versus cnv induced eye so they show significant increase in the cnv significant increase in retinal choroidal blood vessels retaining fluorescence in the cnv induced eye so you use the fluorescence to identify the cnv or choroidal neovascularization in the eye so what we did was we took the uh, created the cnv in the eye and then treated the eye with our drug delivery systems so we use lotapredinol drug delivery system this was the 100% cnv in the initial but when we treated with lotapredinol it went to this level and when lotapredinol drug delivery system it was even further down with ta it did not go as much down as it was expected but ta drug delivery system was almost at par with the lotapredinol drug delivery system so there was a significant if you use simple ta trimethyl acetonide it didn't reduce the cnv but using our drug delivery system it reduced the cnv almost more than 50% and that is where the effectiveness was shown the uh, same thing with lotapredinol you will find lotapredinol drug delivery systems had reduced it the cnv with ta dds also there was a reduction after 4 weeks so continuously 4 weeks the drug can be utilized now sustained efficacy of lotapredinol etabonate drug delivery system compared with le and lds so this is how week 2 and week 4 so obviously it appear that in week 2 you get very good effect but by week 4 you need to have another injection to reduce the cnv into the system so it will be going for one month so at least with the drug delivery system one month frequency of injection will be useful then we compared the ta and ta dds with cnv for 2 to 4 weeks and you will find that in 2 weeks there was significant reduction but you don't see the same reduction in the 4 weeks so there is a need for modification of your drug delivery system in the system now effect of dds and vaja f expression at 4 weeks so this is control cnv le lotapredinol lotapredinol ta reduced significantly and ta drug delivery system vaja f concentration was very low which means they are effectively working as compared to lotapredinol or all lotapredinol drug delivery systems so drug delivery system there was another drug which is widely used so we tried with apatinib for uh, age related macular degeneration so apatinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that has been known to selectively inhibit uh, vajayf2 now there are several vajayf is not Uh, vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 1 2 3 4 they have 4 5 vajayf so which one works we don't know so we try to find out what how the effect is on vajayf2 so vascular endothelial growth factor a vajayf a binds to vajayf2 to maintain control and hemostasis of vascular physiology within the posterior segment of the eye this is a typical structure of the apatinib for Uh, age related macular degeneration so we use the anionic nanoparticle are better than the cationic ions one for penetration into the vitreous cavity that is what we observed and minus 30 millivolts results in significant anti angiogenic effects of choroidal and retinal neovascularization so you always have to have a negative zeta potential so that you will get better effects so our zeta potential was 22.4 they were expecting minus 30 will give you better so this is our party zeta potential uh, distribution of the uh, nanoparticles with apatinib uh, scanning electron microscopy of the apatinib was looking like this so our particle size was around 135 nanometers mean particle size and there were even smaller particles so this was good to uh, move, uh, put it our If encapsulation efficiency in the apatinib was considered to be 65.9 percent, and DLC was around 11.36 percent. And if you look at the PDI, polydispersity index was 0.04, which was very good. And apatinib nanoparticle average size was 278 nanometer. 
pH was 4.48, it is 6.49, so we were in on the other side of it. And zeta potential was minus 22.4, while the blank nanoparticles was minus 30. So we could get our zeta potential very good, it's a stable nanoparticle. And then we studied the in vitro release of the apatinium nanoparticles and we found that up to 350 hours the uh, drug release was almost less than 50 percent were there so this was much better nanoparticles we could develop in the apatinib nanoparticles so cytotoxicity of the um, yeah, this is my mtt is a multi well system you take 100 wells and you put your thing and see the cells and how the cells are killed so pre apatinib solution displayed an average cell viability of 78% apatinib loaded nanoparticle showed 87% cell viability and 100 micromolar free apatinib solution killed 45% of cells apatinib nanoparticles killed 19% of cells so our apatinib were pretty much cyto comfortable they were not cytotoxic as much as the original drug itself then we studied the ELISA, the technology we use for Vajayaf A concentration. Uh, it's a, typically you get the kits to make the analysis of for all these biomarkers. So we found out the free apatinib solution inhibited expression of Vajayaf A by an average of 43% and apatinib loaded nanoparticles expression Vajayaf was 64%. So almost one and a half times Vajayaf concentration was reduced with the nanoparticles in 72 hours which is a good thing to see that and ELISA Vajayaf hours is 72 hours was cell seeding was 5% 5.10 raised to 4 cell per wall well and quantitative analysis was performed using UV spectroscopy and then free apatinib solution inhibited 43% apatinib loaded was 64% so this was also showing us a good uh, Vajayaf 2 concentration reduction so our study confirmed that nanoformulation of the tyrosine kinase inhibitor apatinib is able to improve drug efficiency, sustainability, efficacy and toxicity when compared to the free drug solution. And this drug delivery system will potentially be able to reduce the unwanted side effects of conventional treatments and patient compliance will be increased by decreasing the injection frequency. This is a, we have patented this, we got the patent, US patent for that. Then we work with, you know, like I came here as Fulbright specialist, I had been to Israel. So I was working with Ben, ben, ben Gurion University in Beersheba. Nowadays you cannot go there because it is right yeah. very close to Gaza. So it's a very tough area to be there. But uh, it was a great group. So we had uh, people, Abraham Parola is a senior uh, professor there, Ilana Nathan was my collaborator, like Professor Caesar hosted me. Ilana Nathan was the one who hosted, she is the full rank professor there. She uh, hosted me as the uh, Fulbright special, uh, specialist in Birsheva. And then Ronnie Kosher was another uh, very good scientist. He came to Tampa also. Ilana also came to Tampa. Uh, and Vijay Kumar Sutariya is our associate professor who is my collaborator and uh, I work with him. Or he, you know, I have been I know him for many years. We are very close colleagues. Uh, he is now associate professor in our college. And Om Solanki was uh, one of the students who worked with me. Now he is finished his MD and Rudy Smalling was also a student who was working with me and now he is finishing his MD this year and will go for residency. So this is a joint work between USF College of Pharmacy, University of Florida, Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Natural Sciences, Ben Gurionius, Nigev Birsheva, and then uh, Professor Avaram Abraham H. Parola, he was also visiting Professor of Biophysical Chemistry, Director of Natural Science at NYU Shanghai, uh, People's Republic of China. So I had opportunity to go and work in their labs in China for one month. So I, because Avaram was my good friend. <laughs> so we worked there together. And then we had an Institute of Hematology, Sor Soroka University Medical Center, Bisheva. Ronnie Kosher was there. And then there was a department of desalination and water treatment, Zuckerberg Institute of Water Research, and that was in Israel. And one of this, uh, Ilana also had a um, position with this universe uh, department. So human in nanoparticles are reducing the pathological factors of characteristics of AMD. And humanine is a novel neuronal peptide 
that has displayed a potential in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease through the suppression of inflammatory IL-6 cytokine receptors. So what we thought that if it is anti-inflammatory in nature and works with IL-6 cytokine receptor, can it work in the ophthalmic anti-inflammatory scenario? And that's why such receptors are found throughout the body and it has IL-6 cytokine receptors are also present in your eye. So we thought that UNN may be useful in macular degeneration. So what we did in this study, a more potent humanin derivative, AGA, HNG was encapsulated in chitosan nanoparticles which were characterized for their size, encapsulation efficiency and drug relief and their ability to suppress vajayaf secretion and protect against oxidized apoptosis. It was studied in ARPE cells. Now as I mentioned, if you remember my previous talk, most of the diseases are caused by reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species are ROS. ROS concentration goes up. You see a lot of different types of reactions. So anything which is ROS causes the inflammation. Anything which reduces the ROS are anti-inflammatory in nature. And that is why we thought that human can be a good candidate to study this. So we wanted to see the ability of human in nanoparticle to suppress the vajayaf secretion and against oxidative apoptosis. And we created chitosan nanoparticles, anti ajay properties and oxidative protection of free protein while exhibiting superior functional characteristics and biodegradability, biocompatibility and drug release. This is also patent application is still pending for human in. So we had uh, nanoparticles we created using chitosan. Now in place of PLGA peg we use chitosan as a polymer. It's a natural polymer so it is more biocompatible with the body. So we created and explored that and the particle size was like 150 nanometer and 60. So average particle size was much lower than 200 nanometer because that was what we wanted. Another thing which we are showing was even 73, 83 and so this is based on drug incorporation, increase the particle size and then normal nanoparticles without drug were of lower size. Then we studied the apparent zeta potential and zeta potential was very very good in cell, top, you know, cell counts and then it was very interesting to see that it is very stable there. We studied the drug release of the protein, humanin is a protein, so we studied the drug release and we found out over 300 hours uh, less than 90% was drug released and protease release percentage was you know less than 50% depends on how human in release profiles under same condition. So under same condition means you create adequate amount of material. Suppose you have human in 10 milligram, then all the human in 10 milligram will dissolve in suppose 100 ml, then you have to use 1100 uh, 110 ml so that it is same condition. So everything released will be going under the in the water dissolve. So we try to study the free AGA, ANG and AGA, ANG nanoparticles and we studied the cytotoxicity, cell viability and we found that there was not much cell killing toxicity shown at different concentration of 2.5 micromolar, 5 micromolar and 10 micromolar. So it was very good nanoparticles for our studies. So free ANG and then Vajab secretion we found you can see there was a reduction of Vajab concentration. With 10 micromolar it was significantly down with nano, uh, uh, actual free AGA ANG but with nanoparticles we did not see the similar type of reduction. That means the AGA ANG was not released as much as necessary. That's why we did not see that. So this was one observation was there. So conclusions of human in study showed that this current study of human in nanoparticle illustrate the potential of neuronal peptides. Now we had started with human in but there are several neuronal peptides. So you can utilize them to see if they can be useful for macular degeneration and has in targeting new vascularization characteristics of weight age related macular degeneration. The more potent peptide derivatives exhibited the ability to reduce expression of vajayaf in ARP cells. This study highlights the chitosan nanoparticle drug release system and many desirable functional characteristics including size, surface stability, drug release and biocompatibility. And future research must focus on optimizing the drug delivery system in order to counter nanoparticle tendency to aggregate and confirming the system's efficacy in, in vivo. So as I have mentioned earlier also that we had 
eight papers, research papers in very good journals. We published in chapters, 11 chapters in four different books. Our patent now have reached to five. A sixth one is still in pending. Two edited books in nanobiomaterial ophthalmic dental systems. And I have several students who have now been doing very well in their career. I worked in this project since 2010, almost 10 years. So these are some of my books. And just gracias. Today I completed a little early. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. So any so, questions for me? Questions? Any question? No, let's see the chat. We have some questions on the. Let's see. Alguna pregunta? Oh, we do have people online. No, no, it's, it's, okay, it's yeah, okay, highly research oriented. Okay, so if we don't have any question, well, let's. Do you have any questions so. in your mind? No. 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 It's okay, a, because it's it's a, one a, uh, uh, Is there a difference in the studies with mice? Um, um, male mice and female mice. No, we didn't see the differences because uh, the genes uh, yeah, show the yeah. females. <laughs> but we didn't do that. What we were doing was that we wanted to have consistency. So we used only male mice. As I mentioned earlier, that it, it was very expensive business because. If you want to develop macular degeneration, you use 20 mice and you get only 10 or 8. The rest all cataract. Because injection causes the cataract. So the model is good for cataract or good for macular degeneration. That is interesting. So uh, it is used for mostly uh, macular degeneration, but it takes several animals to be killed. Yeah. And then we take out the new choroidal vascularization. Very small amounts, everything is in micro. So we haven't seen that. That might be a good idea to see it. But you know, based on the amount of money you have, you select that thing, you know. How many mice, for example, for that time study? We normally used to take a set of 20 mice. And at least what we needed was at least six with full macular degeneration. So when we used 20 mice, we have to get like 6 mice or 6 to 8 mice with macular degeneration, that new vascularization formation. So it was not easy because for you have, we tried for 6 drugs. So you imagine for 6 drugs every time using 20 mice, so unnamed 20 mice, a lot of animal exploitation. And in our, in our case, we have a IR, uh, IRB, Institutional Review Board. So the student who got PhD, she was one of the co-editor also for us. So she got her PhD, but she spent six months just to practice how to inject under the guidance of a veterinary doctor. So she, they didn't allow us to inject the drug till she was good with completely ready to inject it. So many mice were killed there. Because learning of the injection was for student. I am older than that. <laughs> but student, was, she was very good. She now worked for US Patent Office. So she did a PAD with us, this area. So veterinary doctor was very useful. We have a very nice team of experts. We have a huge animal house. There are monkeys, rats, mm -hmm. rabbits, dogs pigs, yeah, many of this. So when when we started with rat, this is okay, but unless we have a big NIH grant in million dollars, yeah. then we can go for bigger animals. But to maintain a dog is more expensive and yeah, it's expense-wise. But our target was to get papers, so we got good paper, good patents. 
If the patent gets sold, then probably we may have some money for the lab. We don't need. Points. Interesting. Thank you very much. Any other question? No. If not, so please let's uh, thank the yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you Gracias. very much. See you tomorrow, 10 p.m. Yeah. I'm sorry, I tried to take it, but it took because we had I ran a little bit we had checked some of the slides were discussed in the SIRNA delivery. So I did not do that system.